we became interested in this whole concept of vaccinations about 2008 after seeing a paper written by Gil Melmed in which he showed and uh, demonstrated low rates of vaccination in patients seen in an IBD clinic uh, at Cedar sinai And we felt that this was a great opportunity to try to improve the care that we delivered to our uh, patients and basically embarked on this area of research. So there's a number of things I'd like uh, to make clear to you. The first is that from multiple studies, IBD patients do not receive preventative services at the same rate as general medical patients. Uh, GI clinicians, us in the audience, our nurse practitioners, our nurses, our physicians, are basically often the only patient that a 21-year-old college student will see and often will identify you as their primary care physician. So the first thing we need to do is clarify the limits of our responsibility, make it clear that we're taking care of their colonic issues, you need to go back to your primary care provider. However, it's very complicated when we start adding double and triple immunosuppression for the primary care provider. So clearly make use of your EMR, your EPIC templates, so that when you send the patient back to the primary care physician, that you make very explicit recommendations at what should be done. And I think that we had heard earlier today about combination therapy. My premise here, and again, it's my personal bias, is that we're writing for the anti-TNFs, we're writing for the immunomodulators. It's quite crucial that we, as the prescribers, make sure that patients get these particular health maintenance issues uh, addressed. So we know, and we heard earlier from uh, the talk by Ed, that the immunomodulators and biologic used to treat IBD are putting some of these patients at increased risk. Several, but not all, are vaccine preventable. And unfortunately, you don't need to go very far in the literature to see cases of fulminant hepatitis or even fatal varicella in IBD patients. I'd like to point out, however, that in my referral practice over the last several years, I have noticed a sea change in that more and more patients who are being referred to me, there's comments about health maintenance, there's comments about vaccination. So I applaud each and every one of you who have embarked on taking this into your practice. However, it's not the case everywhere. This was a study from the VA that was recently published, and right off the bat, I have to point out, this is from 2004 to 2014. So we're gonna give them a little latitude in that this is an information that we've really only become to appreciate over the last several years. Vaccination rates were quite low in this VA population. You can see them right here. And despite current IBD guidelines, there's still need for education to try to improve vaccination rates. So the next question is really who should own vaccinations? This was a study we did in 2008 where we queried a number of gastroenterologists and only about half of the gastroenterologists at that time asked questions about vaccination either most or all of the time. And at that point, we clearly, uh, folks who responded to this survey clearly basically said it was up to the PCP to decide which vaccination should be given and certainly it was up to the PCP to administer the vaccinations. However, there are multiple studies, one that was just recently published, looking at querying primary care physicians, and they clearly have concerns about what really what is ustekinumab. Do they know if that's allowed to use, a, use agents like live vaccines in that particular group of patients? So again, we're left with this catch-22 where we're prescribing the agents but expecting the primary care physician who may not be fully cognizant of the risk to administer the vaccines. Now, a question that often comes up especially when talking to patients, and we need to alleviate their fears, is that, Doc, you just told me that I have a disease where I have an overactive immune system, and you want to give me a vaccine that's going to stimulate my immune system. So we have overwhelming evidence to show that vaccinations do not increase the, uh, the severity of IBD. So, and that's the case also in other autoimmune diseases. So reassure your patients that they can be vaccinated. And we have to realize, however, that there's a diminished immune response to our uh, patients who are on combination therapy, especially on combination therapy. So that golden opportunity is often that first office visit while you're formulating a plan to determine which therapy you're going to use to bring them up to date with their vaccinations. We have data looking at vedolizumab as well. Vedolizumab uh, data in healthy, normal individuals, they seem to have a perfectly normal response to parenteral injection, for example, hepatitis B vaccine, but they have a diminished response as would be expected based on the mechanism of action to oral administrative vaccines. And I made the point about vaccination not exacerbating IBD. 
Now, if each and every one of you did not take the flu shot, I think I have to scold, uh, scold you right off the bat. At our hospital, if you don't get the flu shot, you have to wear a mask from, I think, October 31st to, uh, to the beginning of April. And each and every one of us will go to work sick with colds and, and flus and things of that nature. So certainly make sure that you bring yourself up to safe vaccinations and certainly your staff as well. So a number of take home points for this part of the lecture. IBD patients have low immunization rates. IBD patients can mount a response to vaccines. However, that response is going to be diminished in patients on combination therapy with immunomodulators and anti-TNF agents. In the best of all worlds, you're gonna vaccinate prior to initiation of immunosuppressive agents. IBD disease activity will not be affected by the vaccination. And again, take responsibility to either do this in your office, set up systems, make sure your primary care provider knows what recommendations, uh, which vaccines they should receive. So let's give you some practical measures to take back to your office. So every February in the Annals of Internal Medicine, the ACIP recommends or puts out its recommendations for vaccinations for the ensuing year. And you can see it based on age. This is basically looking at adults and another figure you'll see, which is vaccines in immunosuppressed patients. And IBD patients will fit in this group. And you can see all vaccines are yellow if they're approved, depending on the clinical scenario, the purple ones, and the red ones we'll talk about are the live vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, and zoster. So the vaccines that we need to consider, basically the good news is that IBD is unusual before the age of five, although we're seeing more and more IBD in young, young kids. And so theoretically, they should have received all their childhood vaccines. However, 18 states allow exemption to vaccines because of personal or religious reasons. And so this whole concept that the kid or the 18-year-old that you're seeing should have been vaccinated may not be the case in 18 states. So the ones that we have to consider as adult gastroenterologists would be Hep A, Hep B, HPV, influenza vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccines, zoster, and varicella. So what do we do in our clinical practice? Basically, there are a number of things that should be done at your first office visit. Again, you could obtain a history of MMR vaccination. If you don't obtain that history, then you can certainly uh, order uh, MMV, MMR rather, uh, vaccine titers. And there's just a recent paper that was published by David Rubin and Gil Melmid where they showed very low rates, about 11% of patients were not uh, immune to one of those three. Varicella, basically, if you're a baby boomer like me, your parents probably took you to a chicken pox party. I certainly was taken to one when I was three years old. Get chicken pox when you're three, you don't get it when you're 18. If there's no history of getting chicken pox or a history of being vaccinated, you should be tested. Even when you actually elicit that history, there are some patients who are not immune. Hep A and Hep B, we would recommend those being tested unless there's an antibody titer that you have. And then we'll go over in the next slides the vaccines that can be administered to all patients and the vaccines that should be uh, uh, given on a case-by-case -case basis. So regardless of immune status, so these are all inactive vaccines, TD, Tdap. HPV, as you know, is given to both boys and girls, men and women, up until the age of 26. It's three doses. Influenza vaccine is recommended universally to all individuals. I'm gonna show you on the next slide the differences and the timing of both PCV13, which is Prevnar and Pneumovax. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Hepatitis A is given as two doses. Hepatitis B can be given as three doses and can also be given as an accelerated zero, one, and four month or zero, one, and six month uh, regimen. And the meningococcal vaccine is given based on national guidelines. So this comes from a paper that Millie Long published in the IVD journal, and this, having this reference would be extraordinarily helpful to you because it tells you the order to give the PCV13 and Pneumovax, and if the patient has received Pneumovax in the past, the interval that you need to wait whether they're immunosuppressed or not immunosuppressed. So I would recommend that you look at that when you have some time. Now, prior to talking about patients receiving live vaccines, you need to determine what's an immunocompromised patient. So individuals on corticosteroids, prednisone greater than 20 milligrams for two or more weeks, or coming off steroids for up to three months, effective doses of 6-MPAs of thioprim, methotrexate, uh, the anti-TNFs, and don't forget that the patient with significant weight loss and protein calorie malnutrition also is immunosuppressed. 
So let's look at some of the issues for live vaccine recommendation. The first point I want to make is that the CDC has made it very clear, just excuse me, that patients on low dose immunomodulators, so the doses of methotrexate and 6MP are not a contraindication to give a Zoster vaccine. The big controversy comes around what do you do for patients who are on anti-TNFs and what to do about a Zoster vaccine. So there are a number of large epidemiologic studies that basically have tried to determine if patients who are on anti-TNFs have an increased risk of developing disseminated shingles after the vaccine. And so this is a large administrative database study, 460,000 individuals, many of which who had or some of which who had IBD. And what they did was they looked for a code for having a diagnosis of an autoimmune disorder. They looked for a code of receiving the Zoster vaccine and finally looked for a code of being on an anti-TNF. And then they basically determine what percentage of patients or how many patients over the ensuing six weeks then developed a code or had a code for having shingles. And you can see there were no cases, suggesting that potentially we need to reconsider whether we should be giving Zoster vaccine in isolated cases to patients uh, on anti-TNFs. So the vaccine use was safe. And if you follow the individuals the 633 patients who received vaccine and compared them to a group of individuals who did not, we showed, or this study demonstrated a decreased risk of developing shingles. So in addition to it being effective and safe, uh, we need to reconsider, and, and Jean-Fred has written about this in the IBD journal. Now there's an ongoing clinical trial looking actually where we're intentionally giving the live shingles vaccine to patients on anti-TNFs to try to address the issue whether this, is, uh, this should be done. And on a case-by-case -case basis, we have given the shingles vaccine in patients on monotherapy with anti-TNFs after having a discussion of the risk and benefits. Now really, what's in the future for herpes uh, zoster and shingles? Um, New England Journal of Medicine article 2015, uh, a really large study of close to 15,000 patients who received an inactivated uh, subunit vaccine for herpes. And they followed these patients for 3.2 years. And look at, these, look at these numbers. Look at the efficacy of this vaccine. And in particular, when they stratified by age, efficacy was on the order of greater than 95% in all individuals. So this has been submitted to the FDA, I believe in October, and so potentially in 2017, depending on what the FDA says, we may have the opportunity to use an inactive vaccine. Again, we'll need to see what age groups uh, the FDA feels should be receiving this vaccine. The vaccine basically was, however, associated with fairly high rates of significant pain at the injection site. And you can see that these were uh, fairly high rates. And so the issue is going to be uh, whether we can convince patients to prevent shingles to take these. As you can see, serious, um, you know, grade four adverse events were same uh, and, and there were no patients who died. Special considerations, often it occurs, what do you do when mom is the caregiver or dad is the caregiver and their you know, nine month old or 18 month old needs the uh, chicken pox vaccine? The bottom line is it's safe to give the vaccine to those uh, household contacts of the immunosuppressed patient. On rare occasions, you can get a rash at the site of injection and then you need to be careful about uh, con coming into contact if you're immunosuppressed. And there's a lot of information that's been written about the safety of giving live vaccines to infants to whose mothers were on anti-TNFs. And in general, the recommendation is not to give the rotavirus vaccine, which is the only live vaccine given to infants in the first six months of life, uh, unless you either defer that or you can potentially check drug levels in the infant. If there's no circulating drug, then you can give the vaccine. Uh, the whole area of dealing with travelers is very, very complicated. I'm at a university hospital. You can see there are a number of live vaccines and inactive vaccines. So we send those individuals to the uh, travelers clinic for advice as to which agents uh, they can receive and certainly do that several months before they're uh, going to travel. We had seen earlier today David Rubin and Marla Dubinsky's uh, Cornerstones Checklist. You know, at times, we often 
forget the simple things. And we had heard just earlier from Jim Lewis all the things that we have to do in terms of that 20-minute visit uh, with a patient. So having these checklists potentially will allow you to just make sure that something has been addressed. And you don't need to address everything on every visit, but certainly there are some things that are higher on the priority list. So this comes from Cornerstones. This was published, um, and this is now available on the CCFA website. The Professional Education Committee put together a series of recommendations for health maintenance, and it includes vaccinations, cancer prevention, and other things such like DEXA scanning, PPD, and the like. It's not very hard to implement a program in your facility, in your office, to improve vaccination. So this was one that we did in our office. In patients who are basically in the waiting room, there was a one sheet that basically said, have you received the influenza vaccine? If not, would you like to receive it? Today on the back of the form, there was the reasons why you would get the influenza vaccine. And similarly, for pneumococcal vaccine. And you can see that we were able to increase vaccination rates just by making the vaccination available in our practice. Now, I certainly understand that that may not be reasonable to do in every practice situation, but I just checked the other day at CVS in Massachusetts, and CVS, all the inactive vaccines that we just mentioned, they stock them, and the patient can get them in the minute clinic. Certainly, tell your patient that they need to check with their insurance company to make sure there's no surprise, but if you cannot implement vaccination in your own practice, certainly rely on the primary care provider. But remember, they're busy also. An alternative would be to send them to the local pharmacy to get their injection. Now, uh, basically, I've been fortunate enough to work with Gil, Gary Lichtenstein, and Susie. And uh, hopefully in the next two weeks, uh, there will be uh, e-publishing of an ACG guideline that basically looks at both vaccinations as well as a series of other health prevention uh, things such as non-melanoma skin cancer, osteoporosis, smoking, cervical cancer screening. I've covered each and every one of those, but you'll have a table that basically has a series of recommendations of things you should consider doing when you're taking care of your IBD patients. So I will quickly go through those. So basically, to summarize and to end my talk, IBD patients have low vaccination rates. IBD patients can mount a response to vaccines, but remember that that response may be blunted if they're on combination therapy. IBD, IBD disease activity will not be exacerbated by their vaccinations. Ideally, vaccinate on diagnosis and prior to initiation of immunosuppressive agents. And then live vaccines are contraindicated in immunosuppressed patients with certain exceptions. Again, we're anxiously awaiting an inactive shingles vaccine that may really help us, especially if we're able to use it at earlier ages, because we know that shingles is more common in our IBD patients at earlier ages. Thank you very much.